Welcome back to another episode, everybody. Huge shout out for tuning in and thank you so much for joining. Today's episode is going to be called Scuttlebutt. Scuttlebutt. That's what the method is that we're going to use today to find specifically stocks of value. And then we are going to go into the method, why we use this method, what the method, um, you know, what, what, what do you get out of this method, and etc. So stay tuned. So what is a scuttlebutt? It sounds like a weird, is it a bug? It sounds really weird. So scuttlebutt is actually a noun. It's informal use in North America. And it's used for rumor or gossip. It's like a synonym for rumor or gossip. So, you know, the, the sentence that Google has specifically is the scuttlebutt has it that he was a spy uh, because obviously he was saying rumor and gossip, right? So that's what scuttlebutt is. Now, how do you apply scuttlebutt to investing or anything that you want to see what is of value, right? Like, like, how does that make any sense? We'll get to that. So... There's this book called, Un so the book is called Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits, and it's written by a Philip A. Fisher, and he is a value investor to the core. He knows the ins and the outs, and he's gotten amazing returns, close or comparable to Warren Buffett, right? So well, your, first, your first question should be, why does he matter? Then the second question is, well, how can, if it does matter, how can I apply it to my life? So he matters because he is a strong foundation in value investing. What's value investing? I'm glad you asked. Value investing is not purchasing stocks based off of price, but purchasing off of intrinsic value and buying the simplest way, a dollar for 50 cents. That's what value investing is. You find a good company at a le or less than at a great price, less than market value, and you buy it and you hold it or you sell it when it hits the valuation that you think it's, is fair. So the problem the, in, in today's economy is nobody is doing their due diligence on investing, and I am not a certified investor, so don't take my advice, you know, as plain as you know as, as fact. Um, I encourage you to do your own due diligence. Um, you do your own, you know, work and evaluation of companies and stuff like that. And then you make an educated decision. So I'm not telling you to buy any specific stocks or anything like that, okay? I am just merely encouraging you that this is one of many ways, and it's a good way to value a stock. So you can be financially independent or at least wealthy. One of the basic things that we talked about is it's not spending all you make Correct. And the next thing, besides not spending all you make, is investing a portion of that. Making that money work for you. I'm a huge advocate of making money work for you. Because you and your time is finite. Meaning, there's only a certain amount of it. But, and you can only work so much because you have to sleep and you have other things that are going on in your schedule. But money's time is not right? Whether it's two in the morning or two in the afternoon, the money is still working. Whether it's Christmas, it doesn't take holidays, right? So your money can continue to work for you. So this is the scuttlebutt method. I encourage you to take notes, and if all 15 steps, all 15 boxes are checked, then you know that it is a company that you can further dive into. And the best way in order for me to define this, is imagine every single company on the stock market. Then you narrow it down to a thousand, and then 500, and then 250. Once you get the 250 that meets your criteria, which you could just glance at saying, you know, this is something I understand, this is something I don't understand, this company's making money, this company's losing money, this company's growing. Once it meets all those criteria, then you put it against this rigorous evaluation of the 250 and then it'll probably get you down to maybe five because this method is so you know I, I don't want to say monotonous but it's very it's a very in-depth method it penetrates all of the layers think of it like an onion and it goes all the way to the core okay so 
that's what it's called if it checks all the boxes and of those five boxes maybe one hopefully one will meet the criteria of the scuttlebutt method and you can invest in it maybe maybe one or two it's going to be very very slim so it's going to take a lot of time a lot of effort but if you don't want to lose your money in the stock market i encourage you to do this and of course you can still lose your money but when you know and you have targeted your audience and you've targeted you know the stocks that you want to do and you've done an ample amount of research looking at 10ks looking at 8ks and looking at their balance sheet their cash flow then you can make an educated decision with the lowest amount of risk all right so number one first point this has to be expanding the market right expanding the market and what that means is that this company has to be expanding has to be growing it has to be you know it can't just sit stagnant for example logitech the company that makes you know cameras and stuff are they expanding the market are they making the market grow? Are they becoming more of the market or less of the market? You also need to look at that. Apple is clearly becoming more of the market when it comes to cell phones. It's expanding the market, right? Number two, it needs to develop new products. No company, except for one, if it doesn't make any new products, will go out of business. For example, Coca-Cola is the only company that I know of that if they didn't do anything besides Coke that they would still be in business. That's why all of these companies are researching and research and development and R&D and, and doing all these things so they can have new products because you have to grow in order to keep up. I will read you. It's called, I think it's the Queen's uh, Problem or the it's a Queen's Hypothesis, I think. Queen's Hypothesis. So this is called the Queen's Hypothesis. Now here you see it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast. And another one says, here you see it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. And that's the Queen's Hypothesis. Basically that's saying, no matter how fast you run, you have to run as fast as you can just to not go backwards because as soon as you stop innovating, stop being a leader of the industry, stop being all of these things, right, you move backwards. So you need to develop new products in order to propel yourself forward, okay? Number three, research and development must be efficient. There's tons of companies out there that their research and development is piss poor. It's basically, here's $100 million, now it's blown. Like, it's gone. Research and development. That's what it, research and development is, is the scapegoat, right? So, and what I mean by it must be efficient, you need to see how much they're spending on research and development, and then seeing in their cash flow, on their balance sheets, and in their 10Ks, of that research and development money, how much of it is actually being put to good use, and then after you analyze that, you look at their... So you have, you have to go back, and then you look at their, I want to say their future, but it's technically not their future. So here's what I mean. Say it's 2021, like it is in this video. I want to know if Apple's research and development is actually making them money. I look 10 years back, and I see they spent 200 million, 200 million, 300 million, all in research and development. Now I need to go back to present day, today, 2021, and see generally is their research and development making them more money? Are the products that they're research and developing, is the, is the money going back into the product? Is the, is the time going back into the product? For example, if they're research and developing 5G, I want to know if it's actually going back into the product. Is it being efficiently used, right? Number four, average, or sorry, it has to be above average sales. So their sales statistic should be and have to be above average. And here's why. 99.9% .9 of companies sell something. Whether they sell you, whether it's a free product and they give you ads, they're selling you, you're the product. Whether they're selling an actual product, a good or service, everything involves sales.
right? Money changing hands. And their sales must be above average because if you hit a drought and the economy goes to poop, you need those above average sales to then be average sales. This company has to go above and beyond when it comes to selling things. A great example is Apple. They have great ads. They have great products. They have, and the product sells itself. They have, excuse me, above average sales. Right? So, having above average sales is a must because in this industry and in, in the world right now, everything has to do with sales. Right? The world is for sale. So, they have to have above average sales. Number five, I have as handsome profit margin. A handsome profit margin. And you might think, well, that doesn't matter, right? But it does, and it's huge, and here's why. Grocery stores make on average 2%. Software companies make on average from 40 to 60%. That means your return on investment, obviously, on one piece of software versus an apple is going to be completely different. You might need to sell a million bananas at a 2% profit margin to hit 100 or 200 sales of a software product. So the, the profit margins have to be great and have to stay great. It can't be like, yo, we make 40% profit margin, but now it's going down to 10. It needs to have that profit margin. So five is a handsome profit margin. Six is keep that profit margin. It should be their job as a company to do their best and do their due diligence and work for you, right? They should be saying, we need to keep this profit margin for the growth of our company. We need to keep this profit margin for the growth of our shares and shareholders. So that's what they should be doing. They should keep that profit margin at all costs, okay? And that's why I'm okay with them not... We'll get back to that. I have a good point, but we'll get back to that. Number seven, great labor relations. What this means is they have to have a great relationship with their company. For like UPS, for example. They have great relationship with their employees. They give them paid breaks. They give them a handsome very good salary. They take care of them on their holidays. They get sick. They get PTO. They they have health. And they they're taken care of. If you know anything about business, if you take care, the first step of having a good company and evaluating a good company is saying, do they even take care of what's theirs? Do they take care of their employees? Do they go above and beyond? Do they do, you know, just the bare minimum, or do they go above and beyond to take care of their own employees? right? And if they don't take care of their own, own employees and their in-house staff, why would they take care of you? Right? Number eight, I have good ex as executive relations, which means what is their relationship with their CEOs, their CFOs, their COOs? Like, do they have a good relationship with their, with the, their employees, right? Is the relationship with the company, are they toxic? Do they hate the company? Are they just collecting a paycheck? Like, you need to know the higher management of the companies and what they feel and how they're feeling and, and what their, you know, attitude is and how they're being treated in order to make a good decision. Because what happens if you have a disgruntled CEO or CFO? That's when you start having money problems and staffing problems and stuff like that, right? Because they don't. Number nine, I have is de uh, depth in manager uh, management. So there has to be a depth in the management. What I mean by that is there there can't just be one manager running the whole show. It has to have depth. It has to have one manager goes to two managers, two managers go to four, four go to eight, eight go to the central, all the other worker bees. Like There has to be a certain level of intelligence behind their managers and how they're managing, right? Like for example, a one-man show could be great for a small business, but a one-man show could not run Coca-Cola. And you're not investing in a one-man show. You're investing in big businesses. So therefore, these big businesses need to, you need to make sure that, you know, their managers are held accountable. They are good quality managers, etc., etc. Right? The number 10, I have great cost uh, analytics. And, and what I mean by that is 
they're paying the bet. The, excuse me. They're paying the best cost they can for things. They're negotiating things to get cheaper. They're buying things at a discounted rate. They're not paying dividends because that dividend can be reinvested into the company at a greater rate than paying out the dividends. Like you need to make sure that they really care about the cost because if they don't care about the cost and, and you know they just want to please the shareholders, right? Then your stock price is going to go down or it might go up, but it's going to be a you know an artificial you know, it's not going to go up for real. It's going to be artificial, right? So you need to make sure that it's they care about the underlying costs because if they care, then they know that they can get the same thing, $10 for $8, they're going to get the $8 one, right? They have your best intentions at heart. Number 11, I have be outstanding in the industry. The company should be outstanding. And outstanding is the word that I chose and I would use because you don't just want them to be good. You want them to be outstanding. You want them to be the best. You want them to, to have that market presence. Apple is not just a good company. It's an outstanding company. Amazon is not just a good company. It's an outstanding company, right? So be outstanding in its specific industry, right? Like obviously Amazon and Apple are outstanding businesses, but they're not outstanding when it comes into the beverage business. That's Coca-Cola because they don't make beverages, right? So be outstanding in the industry. Number 12 I have is long range profits, not short. They don't care about the short range or they do in a sense of they want to make sure it doesn't go down too much. But at the end of the day, they don't care if it's short range growth, all they care about is long range. Because if you look at something long term, you know that according to a value chart, right, or intrinsic value, it goes up like this, right? So they're not so carried about right here when it's in the starting stages. It goes gradually up. So that's what they're focused on, the, the gradual increase of the company. Okay. Number 13 low risk of dilution. And number 13, there's a reason why this is number 13, because this kills people's portfolio. This is the silent killer. Dilution, dilution, dilution. One more time, dilution. And here is how I will make that clear to you. You own Pizza Hut, okay? There are 10 shares. You own one tenth of the company. You are now entitled to one tenth of the profits. Okay. One day, Mr. Owner says, you know what? I'm going to print off 10 more shares. Now you own one twentieth of the company for the same price you paid. Now they go public. Instead of owning one tenth of the company, you now own one out of 200 million right? Or they dilute you at 2% a year, 5% a year, which means your piece of the pie is now worth less and less because people are now getting more and more. So make sure that these companies are buying back shares or they're not issuing too many shares. A thing that they love to do, businesses love to do, is issue more shares because it's better for them to issue more shares than to issue debt, right? It makes more sense to them but make sure that they are not diluting you, okay? Number 14 I have as communicates risks to. I, you need and I want a company that when, you know, it's great, profit earnings are up 40%, they are slaying the industry. What happens when they're not? <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me again. What happens if they're not? What happens if they're down 30% and they're only up 10% profit margins or God forbid they're down 40% and they're losing money? You want a company that's going to communicate the risks with you too and as soon as possible. Because if you know about this 40% risk, you can change, you can get out, you can do what you have to do. But if they don't communicate the risks too and they only communicate the positives, that means you're in trouble. They, you know what I mean? They need to communicate the positive and the negative. You need an honest company. And the last thing that I have is number 15, unquestionable integrity. Don't trust a liar is what I have in quotes. And this is the only one on the list that's an absolute. If you can get, you know, 14 out of 15, that's great. And I highly recommend getting you 15 out of 15 if you can. But 
unquestionable integrity. You don't have an option on this one. Unquestionable integrity means, is the company doing the legal thing? Is it doing the right thing? And is it doing the right thing by you and everybody else, right? Like say Apple, it hits everything. It's expanding, it's developing. R&D is used very efficiently. It's above average sales. It has handsome profit margins. It keeps that profit margins. It has good labor relations with employees. It has great you know, relationship with its executives. It has a good management structure. It's you know, a good cost. You know, they spend costs and they can cut costs when they can, right? They're an outstanding in the industry. They're long range profits. They're low risk of dilution because they're buying back shares, right? They communicate the risks, but they're, they don't have unquestionable integrity. And this is when you get into big issues because then they start siphoning money. They start getting into the industry of, you know, well, maybe I can take a little bit of skim off the top here, right? You know, that's how you get Ponzi schemes. That's how you get multi level marketing. Like, you have to have un questioning integrity like there is no question about it like these numbers are their numbers they're ac they're accurate you know i trust this company they have good managers i trust the ceo i trust tim cook that he is doing everything that he needs to be doing you know he's on the a game they're not hiding anything from me they might have stuff that they're not disclosing right because they're working on and they're hyping it up but they're not choosing not to disclose information to you because they want to, you know, take the money, right? So that's what I have. What is the scuttlebutt method? It's using slash talking to men on the street and you start street resources. And street resources are basically resources that anybody has access to, right? Scuttlebutt means rumors because in the stock market today, people buy and sell off of what? rumors. So you need to get good, solid facts. You need to see if it hits these 15 points. Look at the intrinsic value of the company. See if it's underpriced, if you can buy 50 cents on the dollar, and then start executing that, right? This is one of many ways to get wealthy. Obviously, with anything with stocks or anything, these companies could go bust tomorrow. But the likeliness and the likelihood of a company with billions of dollars in free cash flow and billions of dollars in net assets and very low cost liabilities is obviously the greater the amount of assets and lower li the, the amount of liabilities, the greater the amount uh, of chance that the company won't go out of business. All right? But that's all I have for you in the notebook today. The scuttlebutt method, hit all 15, check the value of the stock, check the price of the stock, and remember value and price very seldomly hit, but when they do, you buy underneath the value and you sell above the value. Don't buy off of price. That's the number one thing. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you guys coming out. I hope you can apply this to your life. See you in the next one. This video is sponsored by The Candor Wellness.